Now, I will uh, indeed, uh, as Mary trailed out, I will talk uh, a little bit about what the international financial institutions are doing and, and, and maybe can even do, can do even better to uh, help the situation. But I, I want to start with uh, a few remarks about how we see the uh, economic situation. And being the last speaker, I have the, the uh, advantage of uh, being able to pick up and draw together a few points that have uh, already been uh, made. Uh, indeed, I, I, uh, it is a, a gloomy picture uh, as indeed painted by Goran Svilanovic and Vladimir uh, Gligorov, we, uh, I have to say, we, we do share that, that gloom at the moment. We, we try to be optimistic about the region, and I remain optimistic about the long-term future. But certainly, if you look at the short term, uh, we had, uh, in 2012, uh, negative growth in most countries um, in, in the, the Western Balkans. Uh, for 2013, we, we published our new forecast a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> we, uh, we don't expect much growth. It's, for most countries, somewhere between 1% and 2%, with the exception of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we have we've put in 0.1%, so positive, but just barely, and, and Croatia, uh, which has really been in stagnation or recession for the last four years. We uh, expect this year another uh, decline in, in GDP, minus 0.3%. And, and in fact, when I talk to uh, my friends in, in Zagreb, people in the uh, economics and investor community, they think uh, that actually we're being a bit optimistic uh, with, with that figure. So uh, notwithstanding the great achievement of Croatia on the verge of uh, accession, uh, the economy really is uh, in, in a weak uh, uh, state. For 2014, we expect a little bit of pickup. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, 2014 is in, in, in economic forecasting terms is a long way ahead, and there's you know we could get this completely wrong as we often do, but we do expect uh, some pickup, typically between two to three percent growth for most countries, but with a lot of uh, what we call downside uh, risk. And, and I think even if we do get two or even three percent, it's well below. <clears throat> the potential that this region has. And, and uh, Goran Svilanovic mentioned the, the relative GDP per capita compared to the EU average. It's, it's for these countries, when you adjust for purchasing power, and Eurostat publishes these estimates regularly, it's between 30 and 40 percent of the EU average. So these countries should be growing faster. We know from economic theory and from experience that poorer countries should and, and can grow faster than rich ones provided the right uh, conditions are, are in place. Now, why, <clears throat> why has there been no serious recovery from the, the, the major crisis that occurred in 2008 and 2009? Well, I think it's, it's a number of factors, and one can, and some have already been mentioned, one can point to the, uh, the, the collapse of foreign direct investment. I think that's been uh, important. Uh, one can point to the external weaknesses in the Eurozone, uh, which is the main market for most of these countries. Um, that is indeed important as well. One can look at the financial sector, and, and although the financial sector has managed to hold up fairly well, and I, I will come back to that <coughs> in a couple of minutes, we have a, a trinity <coughs> of financial sector problems, the trinity being very weak or even negative credit growth, so it's, it's really harder now for businesses to get credit than it uh, used to be. Um, this ongoing process of deleveraging, so basically the uh, foreign subsidiary banks in the region paying back their debts to their, their parent banks abroad, that's an ongoing process, which again, of course, feeds into the, the weak credit growth. And the third part of this trinity is the uh, non-performing loans which are at fairly frightening levels in, in some countries. They're around, uh, in Serbia, for example, around 20% of all banking loans are, are non-performing, uh, and it's even higher in uh, Albania. So I think these are, uh, these are factors, but I, I, we would argue that uh, actually um, what we have learned over the last few years is that uh, uh, the, the, the boom years that Vladimir spoke about in, in the, say, five to six years before the crisis, that uh, they masked uh, a failure to address uh, some serious structural and institutional reforms. So things seem to be going well, but indeed uh, 
the, the foundations were not really being put in place in the, at that time uh, for uh, sustainable uh, long-term uh, growth. Um, now, so uh, one can see this from uh, a, a variety of indicators, and there are all sorts of uh, indicators on the business environment and progress and transition and uh, uh, corruption and competitiveness and so on, um, some of which we at the EBRD produce, some of which are produced by other institutions. But they, although they can be confusing taken in total, they do paint a consistent picture of a region that is lagging behind on, on structural reform. So, so what we argue is that really uh, it's not, I think, that the region needs a totally new economic model, but the only way forward if it's to get back to economic growth is a, 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 an enhanced focus on uh, structural reforms within a regional context. And I, I, I'm, uh, I take very much the point Vladimir made at the end about uh, some of the disappointing aspects of regional cooperation, but I think uh, if those problems can be addressed, there could be uh, long-term uh, benefits. Now, uh, coming to the, uh, the role of international financial institutions, so IFIs, um, my view, uh, of course, I'm, I'm not an impartial observer here. I work for one of them, uh, the EBRD. Uh, but my view is that uh, IFIs have played an important constructive role in, in uh, uh, alleviating some of the worst effects in the crisis in, in, in the last few years. And it's, it's not just about money and you know, putting money into the region, but although that has been very important and most of the main institutions, including the EBRD, have stepped up their investments uh, in, in the region. So the EBRD is very much a, uh, a counter-cyclical Institution. When regions are doing badly, we do more, and when they're doing well, we step back and let others uh, invest. So we have been investing more, and others have been investing more. But it's also, I think, about putting in place uh, some structures uh, that enhance cooperation, uh, both within the region and between the region and uh, uh, outside countries and, and institutions. And let me mention those three initiatives that I think have, have really helped uh, in the last few years. One is uh, what's called the Vienna Initiative. So the Vienna Initiative was really about making sure that we didn't have a banking crisis in the Western Balkans and, and, and more widely Southeastern Europe and, and some other countries as well. And it was about ensuring that the, uh, the f major foreign banks that, that dominate the banking sectors in these countries, that they remained engaged, that they didn't all rush for the exit and pull their money out of the countries, which could have caused uh, a panic. Uh, that was a very important uh, cooperative effort between IFIs like ourselves and the IMF and World Bank and others, uh, host countries, so in the Western Balkans, home countries in Austria, France, Italy, Greece and so on with, that are home to these big banking groups uh, and, and regulators uh, in, in both home and host countries. It, it worked well and it helped prevent this, uh, uh, it helped prevent a crisis. The second one was uh, the joint action plans that institutions like ourselves, the European Investment Bank and the World Bank came up with, which again were really about showing strong commitment to the region and about uh, promising, pledging major investments into uh, the region. I think that the, the, the initial joint action plan in 2009 was a very strong signal and there's a new action plan for all of Central and Southeastern Europe announced by those three institutions uh, at the end of, of 2012. And thirdly, uh, has already been mentioned, the, um, the Western Balkan Investment Framework and, and uh, others around this panel and Mary certainly know uh, <coughs> intimately how, how this works and, and how it has really, I think, been a, a very successful cooperative venture in terms of, of uh, uh, making sure that funding uh, donor funding, whether it's lending from institutions like the BOD or grant financing from bilaterals, that it goes to uh, it goes to the uh, it goes to the right projects. Now, having said all that, uh, I want to finish with uh, a few remarks about um, how IFIs can and can maybe work better. I'm, I'm speaking, of course, you know, my, my personal uh, opinion on these, and I think there are, are three ways in which. Uh, uh, the, the, way we, we, uh, the way we are involved in the region can be uh, made even more effective. One would be, uh, I think, even more cohesion than we have already 
on strategy development. And, and uh, this is an idea that uh, came to me in preparing these notes because uh, it's fresh in my mind from the EBRD annual meeting a couple of weeks ago in Istanbul where we indeed sat down with some of our colleagues from the World Bank and the European Investment Bank and, and uh, uh, the IFC also, which is part of the World Bank, uh, to think about uh, you know, what are we doing in each country and can we really uh, mobilize our time frames in a consistent way and, 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 and really come up with a, a very coherent <coughs> growth strategy for uh, countries in, in this part of the world. Uh, a second way I think we can do more is to have a more rigorous analysis of uh, what really is holding back growth in, in this region, a, a, a more rigorous diagnosis of the obstacles to growth and, and, and the constraints. Because I mentioned earlier the, some of these cross-country indicators on reforms and business environment and so on, but they, they don't really tell you on a country-by-country -country basis what are, the, what are the key blockages to, uh, uh, to reform. And I think, uh, again, there's a lot of analytical power in these institutions and it, and it can be deployed maybe more effectively than it has been before. And the third way would be uh, to pay more attention to social issues. So I, I take very much, uh, it wasn't news to me, but I, I really appreciate uh, what Goran said and, and Vladimir about uh, the problems of unemployment in the region. It really is indeed a, a frightening uh, set of figures when you look at the unemployment rates. Possibly some of them are a little bit exaggerated because there's a lot of informal employment and so on, which is maybe not captured. But notwithstanding that, there is indeed a, a, a serious uh, jobs problem, and, and as uh, Ms. Papadopoulou said at the start, it's, it's really about jobs, growth and reforms, and jobs, I think, rightly being the, the first, uh, first of that uh, trinity being mentioned. So I think IFIs, and, and here at the EBRD, we are doing some serious thinking about how we can build an analysis of social issues to do with things like youth unemployment, to do with things like gender differences and so on, into our analysis of projects, and, and, and uh, indeed this is becoming an increasingly important part of our, uh, of our overall strategy. So in conclusion, I, I, I don't want to end on that very gloomy note because I do really feel that, that this region has a bright long-term future. I'm not sure if in 10 years' time we'll have three countries or, or, or whatever as members of the European Union, but I, I really do feel that in 10 years' time this will be uh, a much more prosperous region than it is now. But it's going to be uh, uh, still, I think, a difficult two to three years that we face uh, in front of us. Right, thank you.